guys, uh, why don't we invite Chuck up and we'll, uh, we'll pray for him. So if anybody wants to come down and pray, we'll just uh, gather up here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we can gather as, as one body just to lift your name up. Um, Lord, I pray specifically um, for Chuck that you would just speak through him this morning, um, that our hearts would be prepared and ready to hear your word spoken through him. Lord, just watch over us today and this week as we glorify and praise you. Amen.
just broke the earth into motion. My soul now just stands. Used to be for my failure and carried the cross for my shame.
It's our hope that chapel will be a time of intense personal reflection and deep existential crisis. But we usually don't expect it to happen when the speaker is making his introduction and telling you funny things like Greg Clugston did on Monday. Remember when he talked about how old he was? Well, that was a moment of existential crisis because when he said, your speaker is so old that he was here in Spring Arbor before McDonald's was, I thought, wait a minute, your present speaker is so old that that chapel speaker was one of his students. <laughs> and your chapel speaker is so old that three of his grandchildren are here to listen. Now, since they're four, two, and not even one, they may not get as much out of it as you will. <laughs> but they are prouder. <laughs> now, very few chapel speakers come up and tell you, here's the intellectual inspiration for this talk. Here's a better form of it. And here are the main ideas. But here's the intellectual inspiration for this talk. It's C.S. Lewis. He gave it as a chapel talk at St. Mary's Church, and he did it. It's called Learning in Wartime. You can go to the library and get it out, or you can Google it. And he gave it in December of 1939. And in that talk, he made several main points, but two of them, which I want to make today, are these. The first one is that ideas are important. Now, Lewis was talking at a time when the German forces had overrun Poland and were ready to plunge Europe into a holocaust of death and destruction. And the students sitting at Oxford listening to him were the ones who would be called upon to fly the airplanes, to lead the men in the trenches, to pilot the ships that would defend the world for two years alone until the United States got involved in the war. And those men were facing death. And how in the world could they be studying Greek and Latin and mathematics and politics when the world was tottering on the precipice of, a Nazi, of Nazi domination. And Lewis had to answer that question. And part of his answer was that ideas are important. And the second part is that thinking hard is God's will for you. Well, our world is not tottering on the precipice of Nazi destruction. But Lewis pointed out that we're always involved in a bigger war. The bigger war is for the souls, the eternal destiny of women and men, compared to which our life is just a finger snap. And that the real war is a war that involves eternal consequences, not just the rule, the rise and fall of nations. And that that war is infinitely more serious, but in that war, that ideas are important and thinking hard is God's will for you. Our scripture for today is John 1, NRK, En halagas, kai holagas, 
and proston theon, kaitheus and holagas, otus and an arche proston theon, panta diato igenito. Which, as you all know, is in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. He, or this one, was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Now to the poet, we know that this is a modified chiasmus. And the structure is important there. We know to the philosopher, John, this passage validates reason and solves the problem of the one and the many. And here is a picture by Raphael. It's called the School of Athens. And if you look at the detail, right in the center, there's Plato with his hand up. And the Logos brings these two, th two philosophers together and these two ideas together. Plato, with his hand up, is pointing to the one, to the idea of ideas. The word was God, the one God. But Aristotle's got his hand out, and his hand is down. And Aristotle's emphasizing the many, the particulars. And Aristotle's side is that the word was with God. It was different from God. The Lagos is God, but the Lagos is different from God. And that embodies the one and the many problem. What about to psychologist? How does John speak? John says ideas are important and that correct religious ideas we know from psychology and psychiatry are the key to mental health. If you look, people who have correct religious views, correct ideas about God, have much fewer problems with alcohol, with drugs, with crime, with depression, with stress, with suicide, and with divorce. It's empirically validated. They also are much more physically healthy, they have happier marriages, and they report more sexual fulfillment because they have right ideas. To the social worker, John 1 points out that God exists in relationship and that relationships are the key to healthy life as individuals for us as people. To the marriage counselor, John, with its emphasis on ideas, points out that sinful ideas, like porn, for instance, disable the relational sections of the brain. Here's a book in our library. It's called Wired for Intimacy. And it talks about brain chemistry, and it points out how watching porn actually changes the molecules in your brain and rewires your brain so that it is less capable of experiencing relational intimacy. Pictures on the screen change the chemicals in your brain and disable you from having a healthy relationship with your spouse. To the biologist, John points out that information is the key to life. You think about DNA and how in our genes, that there's more information stored there than, than in a whole edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Or if you really think about it, on some level, the difference between a simple chemical reaction, like, you know, the acid dissolving the food in your stomach, that's a simple chemical reaction. But a biological process often involves information. And what makes something biological rather than just chemical? One of those differences is information. When a gene codes for how an amino acid is supposed to be made, it's the information that makes the difference. In, to a neurologist, John, with its emphasis on ideas, points out, helps us understand that through neuroplasticity, the mind shapes the body. Chris Newhouse is working on this. And Chris and others are discovering neuroplasticity means that what you think changes your brain. Fascinating book written by Norman Doge. What he points out 
is he, he does studies of people with, with strokes. And there was a, a famous poet in Spain. His name was Pedro Baquirita. And he had a massive stroke. And two of his sons were doctors. And they got a call from his doctor and said, he's had a stroke and after six weeks, there's no sign he's going to get better. He will never be able to move. He will never be able to talk again. You've got to find palliative care just to take care of him until he dies. The two brothers decided they wanted to help their father in a different way. They knew how strong he was, how fiercely independent he was, and how it would just kill him to be, independ to be dependent. So one of the sons said, Dad, you once learned to walk by crawling. I'm going to teach you to learn to walk again. And he got down with his dad on his hands and his knees. And he taught the dad agonizingly to put one hand in front of the other, one hand this way and this way, and then to be able to crawl on his knees. And then there was a wall taught him how to, how to walk, supporting himself by the wall, and finally how to walk. He later helped to learn, taught him how to type so he could communicate. He learned to speak. He actually went back to his university teaching. He had a stroke in, the 60, in his 60s. In his late 60s, he went back to university teaching. He got married, and he started climbing mountains. One day, he was climbing a mountain, had a massive heart attack, and died. Well, you're going to die sometime. <laughs> Which is better, to have a stroke and die in bed, or to have 10 years of activity and die climbing the mountain? Well, after he died climbing the mountain, they did an autopsy. And they brought the record in to one of the sons, one of the doctors, and the pathologist was really excited, but the son didn't want to see. He was grossed out by the idea of slicing through his father's brain and looking at the pictures. But the pathologist was so excited that the son said, okay, I'll look at him. And what they discovered was that the original stroke had severed 97% of the connection of the conscious brain with the body and that that had never been fixed and they could see it was still there. But through neuroplasticity, the brain had developed other areas, and they could see the physical traces of where the brain redeveloped to teach him to walk, to talk, to be involved with other people. But that's not the most interesting part of the story. The most interesting part of the story is the doctor who helped to teach his father to walk went on to help blind people see. Neuroplasticity helps blind people see. How does that work? They have a little piece, uh, an electrode, the size of a piece of gum, and it has probably a hundred different sections on it that get electrical impulses. You put that on your tongue. Then you have a TV camera which feeds information into a computer which then sends impulses on to that stick of gum on your tongue. With that, people have learned to read even though they had been blind from birth. What happens is the brain rearranges itself. It gets input through the tongue and somehow figures out that it's supposed to send that not to the taste sensation, but to the part of the brain that works with the optic nerves. And the information, the brain takes the information through the little tingles on the tongue and the brain processes them and uses them to make sight so people can read. People can see if you throw something at them, they have three-dimensional vision. That's neuroplasticity. The brain can really change. And it's the ideas that change the brain. And and Dodge says that through cognitive therapy, 
you can have greater effects on the brain, more changes on the brain chemistry than drugs do. And just as you put chemicals in your brain and it changes your brain chemistry, you put different ideas in your brain, it changes your brain chemistry. And in, well, they saw that in, in, in the, the poet, but then in, in tests that they've done with animals, they've seen the changes in the animals. Ideas shape the brain. What else do ideas shape? Here's a really fascinating book in our library. I have no idea why we bought it. Geons, Black Holes, and Quantum Foam, A Life in Physics by John Archibald Wheeler. Now, John Archibald Wheeler never won the Nobel Prize, but five of his students did. I've never won the Nobel Prize, so it's up to you. <laughs> okay, but what he points out is information is the key to reality. And he has this diagram, and the idea is it from bit. It is something that exists, and bit is information. And the idea is that the universe exists, but then the universe produces an eye, and the eye looks back at the universe and causes it to exist. And here's the idea. That in quantum physics, nothing is real until it's observed. And here's what he says in the book. And you probably can't read that. So let me read it for you. Information may not be just what we learn about the world, it may be what makes the world. This is a physicist taught five Nobel Prize winners. He says information makes the world. An example of the idea of it, existence from bit, information, is this. When a photon is absorbed and therefore measured, until its absorption it had no true reality, an unsplittable bit of information is added to what we know about the world. And at the same time, that bit of information determines the structure of one small part of the world. It creates the reality of the time and the place of that photon's interaction. So, which comes first, atoms or ideas? When you think the atoms in your brain move around, or is it when the atoms in your brain move around, you think, which comes first? Well, a lot of people think they know, and they think it's the atoms. Bertrand Russell's like that. Bertrand Russell says, humanity's origin, our growth, our hopes and fears, our loves, and our beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocation of atoms. We've read that in Free Man's Worship in Core 300. All your ideas only go through your head because the atoms happen to accidentally bump into each other. That's why you chose Spring Arbor University. That's why you're wearing the color shirt you wore today. That's why you made the decision to wear shoes, because the atoms bang together in your head. And it was really lucky that you chose to wear clothes today because of the atoms. That's <laughs> so what Bertrand Russell says. Eugene Wigner, a friend of Einstein's, says this. He wrote an amazing paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And he says, The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. What he's saying is we have no idea why math works. And if you know anything about the philosophy of mathematics, he's right. Started out with Kurt Gödel with the uncertainty principle, and don't get me going, I really love this part. But, but Wigner points this out. Now, Wigner's not a Christian. He doesn't know why math works. But he says, hooray, let's use it. Einstein, same problem. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Why do we get it? Why is there any relationship between what we know and what happens out there? Oh, well, Paul Davis points out that finding mates and avoiding trouble, that your brain can do that through natural selection. 
But why should we be able to understand atoms? Why should we be able to understand black holes? You can say, okay, well, I can understand how a cheetah evolves to be faster than a gazelle. But let's say a cheetah could run 600 miles an hour. How can you explain that? Now, our brains can do things like avoid trouble and find mates. But why can our brains go 600 miles an hour? Why can our brains do so much more than what is necessary for mere survival? Einstein says that's incomprehensible. Stephen Hawking says philosophy is dead. Says thinking is not the way to solve the problems. Philosophy is dead. But on the other hand, we Christians know the answer. We know why math works. We know why the universe is comprehensible. We know that our thoughts, our beliefs, our dreams, our hopes are not just the accidental collocation of atoms. Alvin Plantinga teaches at Notre Dame. He pointed out that if naturalism is true, there's no reason to believe it. It's irrational. All our thoughts are irrational. And why should we believe irrational things? Or John Lennox, a mathematician from Oxford. He's a Christian. He says, we, can, we think, therefore, it must be that God exists. It's because of the ideas that we know. We think we have ideas. Therefore, we know there's got to be a source of the ideas. And the accidental collocation of atoms is not the source of ideas. So which comes first, atoms or ideas? Well, we know the answer. In the beginning was the word. And today, from biology and neuroplasticity and quantum mechanics and our trust in rationalism, they all go together. They all agree with God's word that ideas come first. As I said, this is not what you will get at secular universities who do not believe in God, who do not accept John, who have no idea why math works. Ideas come first. Okay, what are you supposed to say at the end of every sermon, end of every chapel lecture, the end of every class? So what? Exactly, so what? What difference does this make? I've given you ideas. Well, guess what? Your brain chemistry is now different. We're going to do autopsies on each of you to see. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe that's not such a good idea. Not yet. Okay. Well, how about other than autopsies? What could be different? God has given you four years to focus on ideas. That's what a university is for. Four years when most of you don't have responsibilities of families, most of you don't have responsibilities of providing for other people, you don't have the responsibilities of defending the nation against war, you don't have the responsibilities of putting food on the table. God has given you four years probably the only four years that will ever happen for most of us where we can focus on ideas. Four brief years. So prioritize your mind. That's what college is for. Now the problem with college is that we do it together. Hooray! But you can always find somebody at Spring Arbor University who wants to waste time with you. No matter what time it is of the day or night, there will be somebody hanging out who will say, let's waste time together. <laughs> right? Now, don't poke your roommate. You know, you may be sitting next to that person. You will always find time. And it's really easy in college to prioritize sports or prioritize finding a mate or prioritize video games or prioritize watching movies. There are all kinds of other priorities. 
but ideas are important. And God's will for your life is hard thinking. Prioritize your mind. And God says that. God says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All right, here's where the rubber hits the road. Here comes opinion area. This is not from God's word. I want you to think about it. Number one, I challenge you to spend at least 40 hours a week on academics. At least 40 hours a week. What a devastating idea. <laughs> There's 168 hours in each week. 168 hours in each week. 40 of them, at least, should go to academics. Now, if you're one of the super brilliant people that can get all A's working 30 hours a week, then spend the extra 10 hours a week growing your mind in other areas. At least 40 hours a week. Now, did you guys know that the average college student for every book she reads, every book he reads, guess how many movies? 100? Too high. 50. 50 movies for every book. Whoa. Aren't you spending your college well? <laughs> there was a guy when I was in school, we called him Movie Smith because he went to a movie every afternoon. And a, we students just couldn't believe that. He went to a movie every afternoon. Okay, here's my challenge. There's about... Oh, 14, 12 to 14 weeks till Christmas. Yeah, hooray. <laughs> oh, there's a lot that's going to happen between now and then. Detroit's got to get eliminated in the playoffs. The, you know. I don't want it to happen. But they're playing Boston for crying out loud. Okay. All right, all right. I don't want that to happen. I want them to do it. I know it won't. Okay, ne never mind. <laughs> okay, you think that's controversial. How about no movies till Christmas? <laughs> no! No! Okay, okay, okay. All right, listen. Okay, just no food till next week. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. How much time are you going to spend watching movies between now and Christmas? What if instead of time watching movies, you read books? What if you read, beside the books for your classes, you read one book each month? One in October, one in November, one in December. Are ideas important? Is hard thinking God's will for you? Yes. Do movies lead you to think hard, usually? Yes. Sometimes, good, hooray. After Christmas, you can do it. <laughs> Read books instead. Here's a little bit easier one. Pursue your questions. Pursue them through reading, but also pursue them through faculty. We faculty love to talk to you. We love nothing more than have you say, let's go for a run, let me come sit in your office, let's go eat lunch together, let's talk about ideas. That's what we do. You got four years when people are your servants for the sake of your mind to answer your questions and help your thinking. And we try to do that in class, we try to do that in chapel, we try to do that in our interactions, but we can't read your minds. But you can come to us and say, I'm thinking about this. Will you help me think it through? That's what we live to do. That's why we teach 
at Spring Arbor University. Everybody who teaches here could do a different job in a different place for a lot more money. But we love ideas. We love you most of all. We love the Lord most of all. Then we love you. Then we love ideas. And so talking to you about ideas is a way to serve God, and it's something that we all love to do. Take advantage of us. Now, Tony Campalo is one of your favorite chapel speakers, I know. Tony Campalo writes books. Tony Campalo has great ideas. He wrote a book with Mary Darling. We were talking to him. We said, how do you write all these books? Tony Campalo said, I never watch TV. Now, just watching, not watching TV is not going to make you a great author. <laughs> it's necessary, but not sufficient. Tony Campalo says, I never watch TV. What about Denise Patch? Do you admire her, what she said, what she has done for the Lord? Well, what she has done for the Lord requires a lot of hard thinking, requires organization, requires taking in data, making judgments, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. It's hard thinking. Denise Patch is able to do what she does and to stand before you and to save those lives of women and children in Burundi because she thinks hard. Greg Clugston, the guy who was just here on Monday, how does he get to be a correspondent in the White House? He does so by talking sense. He does so by writing. He does so by asking penetrating questions. He does so by background reading. He does so by knowledge. It's ideas. It's ideas that make Tony Campalo great. It's ideas that make Denise Patch great. It's ideas that make Greg, Greg Clugston great. And it's ideas that God wants to give you through your hard work to glorify him. In the beginning was the word. Let the word be the beginning of your intellectual life. And then your light will shine so people will see your good deeds motivated by your good thoughts and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that our ideas are not the mere collocation of atoms but that we can think your thoughts after you. That because you are the Lagos and you put the Lagos into us, we are made in your image, we can think logically and rationally. Help us to do so in a way that honors you. We pray in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.